Okay, I'm back with Tom Libby, and Tom is industry analyst based out of Michigan, and we're going to continue our conversation talking about uh, the full-size truck segment, uh, which is a continuation from Auto Trends with JeffCars.com. So, Tom, let's uh, continue uh, the conversation we were having about the full-size trucks and and with gas prices actually rising at this point. Uh, well, gas prices are not rising right now, but with gas prices uh, at some point expect to rise again, let's talk about the whole shift of consumers shifting toward right now temporarily toward full-size trucks, full-size SUVs. I'll let you take it from there. Sure, Jeff. We're seeing um, with these lower gas prices, we are seeing a shift to uh, full-size pickups as well as to full-size SUVs. And um, uh, one thing to bear in mind is that the manufacturers have done a terrific job and continue to do a terrific job of improving the fuel mileage of existing powertrains so that these six-cylinder engines now um, and eight-cylinder engines are getting much, much better gas mileage than they did 10 years ago or even five years ago. So that you see these full-size pickups on the road and you think that they're not getting that good gas mileage, but in actuality they are. Yes, they're not getting 40 miles to the gallon, but they are getting 20 to 25. As a matter of fact, the full-size Ram pickup with the diesel powertrain gets 29 miles to the gallon. So so that also contributes. That makes it much more attractive to the consumer when you have a large vehicle that has all the towing capacity, the bed size that you need, and it gets great fuel mileage. So that's contributing to the uh, popularity of these big these big trucks. What about also Ford has the EcoBoost? How's that how's that done and how's that fair with them? That's doing very and that speaks exactly to what I was mentioning just a minute ago. That's that's the best example actually of the manufacturer greatly improving the efficiency of an existing powertrain. Ford is taking their six-cylinder engine and they've basically re-engineered it and redesigned it so that now it gets the fuel economy and the power, which is even more impressive, of an eight-cylinder engine. So their Ford's mix or their percentage of engines with the EcoBoost has skyrocketed and it was much, much higher than they thought it was going to be. They had to adjust production levels. So that's a great example of how the manufacturers have improved efficiency in order to make these full size pickups and bigger vehicles uh, attractive. As we talk about also the full-size market, a full-size truck market, let's also look at the reintroduction of the, the compact segment or the, the mid-size uh, uh, segment is in, within trucks. We're looking at uh, now there are, well, there were up until recently just two players in the segment, which was the uh, Nissan Frontier and the Toyota Tacoma. And then recently you had two uh, two uh, vehicles to reenter the marketplace, which was uh, Chevy just reentered with their vehicle with the Canyon. Um, and uh, GMC also just re uh, well Chevy just re-entered with the Colorado, and GMC just re-entered with the Canyon. Uh, let's talk about uh, do do you see an explosion in this segment while the large segment may dip some, or, or where do you see this whole segment going with uh, with the compact segment as far as trucks? Well, the um, it's an interesting situation. The the, the compact or what we call now the midsize pickup truck segment had been before the introduction that you mentioned of the GM products, that that segment had only had about one and a half percent of the whole market. It was very, very small. And part of that was what you mentioned also. There were only a few players. Ford does not participate in the segment. Neither does uh, Dodge nor Ram. So it had been one and a half percent. When Chevrolet came out with the redesigned Colorado and GMC launched the Canyon, the segment share jumped to 2.1%. And we, those numbers may sound small, but remember, this is a 17 million unit industry. So it's big volume. And also, that's a, if you take that, those numbers, it's a big increase. So, so the GM launch did, did um, push up, did enlarge the overall segment. Um, it remains a relatively lo- a small segment relative to the whole industry. But still, GM has been successful. They've, they've enlarged the segment, and they've, they've gotten good traction. The Colorado and the Canyon have been well-received. Um, they have not yet really hurt the big pickups that much. Really, what GM did was sort of see a space underneath the big pickups. And so you have a consumer who doesn't need the size and all of the, uh, uh, of the functionality of the full-size pickup, but yet they want a mid-size pickup. So now they have more options. So it's, it's, I mean, it's doing, those new products are doing fine. The segment is doing fine. And frankly, if the segment continues at this higher level than it was before the GM launches, Ford is probably going to relook at it because Ford is a very, very competitive truck maker, and they're not currently there. And if GM continues to do well and Toyota does very, very well with the Tacoma, we may see uh, Ford take another look and say, hey, maybe we should be there also. Now, Tom, doesn't Ford offer the Ranger, although it's not being built here in the States, 
isn't it offered in uh, other regions of the of the world? It is. That's a good point. It is offered in other parts of the world, and that makes one wonder why doesn't they, why don't they offer it here? Um, the the main reason is that um, the, the manufacturers have to achieve a certain volume in order to make these product programs profitable for them. And remember, I mentioned that whole segment, that whole category was only one and a half percent of the market. And when you do the math and you figure out what the projected volumes are for one model within that very, very small segment, that's what Ford did quite a few years ago. And they basically concluded, you know, we can't do it with the small segment size. So that's why they're not selling it here in the United States. But again, if the segment continues to be larger than what it was several years ago, Ford may take another look. And what's the advantage for consumers as far as this whole truck explosion now, since you've got the, the uh, medium-sized truck segment and the, then you also have the full-size truck segment? Well, again, what's the advantage for them from a consumer standpoint when they're out in the market buying a vehicle and there's a discount on the hood of some trucks that could range anywhere from nine to $10,000? What's the advantage of them selecting a mid-sized truck over a full-size truck? Well, the, the, first of all, when, when more mo- in general for the consumer, when more models come on the market, such as these additional GM models, uh, it's better for the consumer because competition increases. And whenever competi- there's greater competition, that's, that puts downward pressure on prices. So, they, so, um, whenever, so that's a general market you know, reality, and the consumer benefits in that situation. In this situation, um, it's, 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 it's a hard, it's, it's a challenge for the manufacturers to market both categories simultaneously, because what happens is, if somebody's going in for the midsize pickup, for instance, somebody sees an ad, a consumer sees an ad for the Colorado, they've been a Chevy customer in the past, so on and so forth, they go into the showroom, they see the Colorado, it's very nice, it's brand new, it's got the latest technology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, the challenge, the, 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 there's a Silverado sitting right in the same showroom that may only be $20 a month more expensive than the Colorado. So the salesman may very well say to the consumer, you know, for only, you know, um, X $20 more a month, I, I can give you this Silverado where you're going to get much more space, et cetera, et cetera, than you will with the Colorado. So what happens is the, what, the, the reality of the marketplace, Jeff, is that the manufacturer has to keep the two products separate from each other in terms of pricing so they don't get that cannibalization or one hurting the other. So but to answer your question, sorry, a long way around here, but to answer your question very quickly, the midsize pickup is obviously has a lower price point. It's going to have a lower monthly payment, but it still offers a lot of the functionality of the full-size pickup. You get a bed with a cab, et cetera, et cetera. So the main point is, the main advantage is from a price standpoint. Okay, so pricing. And when we look at also the, the whole market as a whole and, and consumers shifting toward trucks, it seems as though they're walking away or leaving behind the midsize sedan market, which is very competitive. When we look at the midsize sedan market, we're looking at uh, the Toyota Camry. We're looking also the Ford Fusion. We're looking at the Honda Accord, uh, the Nissan Altima, the Kia Optima, and also the Hyundai, um, Hyundai Sonata, to, to, to name just a few. Let's talk about why is this market so important to the automakers and why is this market seem to be collapsing somewhat, too? Well, it's a good question, Jeff. Um, It's important because it's still, even though it is declining, it's still one of the largest categories in the industry. Those mid-sized cars you mentioned together account for about 15% of the market, and it's, it's one of the biggest categories in the industry. So there's a lot of volume there, so that's why it's important to the manufacturers. Also, another reason why it's important to the manufacturers is that some of them, specifically Honda with the Accord and Toyota with the Camry, uh, these are these are leaders, and these are very very well known names. And in the case of the Camry, it's the most popular car in the United States. And believe me, Toyota wants to keep it there. And so they are doing everything they can in terms of frequent redesigns, in, turn, in terms of incentives, et cetera, et cetera, to keep the car competitive. So for those reasons, those models are very very important. Now, why is it declining? Well, it is declining slightly. It had been over 16 percent. It's down to 50, about 15 percent. Uh, the main reason is that the appeal of crossovers and crossovers are these vehicles um, such as the uh, the um, Ford Edge, the Ford, the uh, Toyota Highlander, the Chevrolet Traverse, uh, the Ford Explorer, so on. These are vehicles that look like SUVs, but they're actually car-based vehicles, so they drive just like a car, and so you get the double advantage. You get the best of both worlds with crossovers. You get 
get the driving comfort comfort level like a car, whereas you get all the functionality. You get the high seating position, you get the storage capacity, you get the towing capacity, off-road, all-wheel drive. So the, the, these crossovers have just been skyrocketing in terms of sales. They're as hot as can be, and they are taking sales away from the traditional midsize cars. So as we talk about uh, the, the whole crossover segment, let's move toward minivans also. What's going on with that segment? Uh, at one point, that minivan segment was just explosive, and it seemed to have uh, a, a lot of automakers have pulled out of that minivan segment. A GM, for one, pulled out of it, and they focused on crossovers. Ford did the same thing, focusing on crossovers. But on the other end of it, you've got uh, Kia, who just reentered the market with a uh, – well, they've been there for a moment, but they just came out with an all-new redesign. Let, let's talk about that and, 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 and look at the difference between the minivan segment and what's going on in the crossover segment. No, it's interesting, Jeff. Uh, it's a great point. What's happening is that um, – the, what, what has happened in the last 10 years is that the minivan buyer, the minivan consumer, has shifted in general over to crossovers. Um, but also, as you mentioned, simultaneously we saw two major manufacturers, Ford and GM, pull out of the minivan market. Um, but the manufacturers that have stayed in the market and continue to make minivans, like the Chrysler Town & Country Dodge Caravan and the Honda and Toyota models, and as you mentioned, Kia, they're doing okay. So while that category has declined in volume, it remains. It remain. It's still there. And um, uh, but the the Fords and GMs have figured. You know, we can get those consumers with a crossover. There are some advantages that the crossover has over the minivan. One is that you can go off road. You have the option of going off road and getting all wheel drive with a crossover, and that's almost not available at all with minivans. But on the other hand, minivans have some advantages also. They have the sliding doors. They also have the removable third seat. They're very family friendly, and they've been designed that way. So um, while we've seen the decline in minivans, and you're right, it's nothing like it was uh, 15 years ago, it seems to have leveled off, and the manufacturers are still there, are doing okay. But in general, frankly, Jeff, the, the market has shifted in general towards crossovers. And as we're talking about, uh, we slid right in from minivans. Uh, before minivans, we talked about also crossovers, and we talked about the midsize car segment. But we can't forget about also the, the compact segment. And when the compact segment we're looking at, and the subcompact segment, we're looking at Toyota Corolla, we're looking at the Honda Civic, we're looking at the Chevy Cruze. What's occurring in that market right now? Well, that, that compact car segment with the models you just mentioned is, is, is also one of the biggest categories, and that's about 14% of the industry. Um, it has gone down a little bit, um, but those cars, the Corolla, the Civic, the Focus, the Cruze, the Sentra, et cetera, et cetera, remain high-volume models, very popular models, and they're key models for the manufacturers. But what we've seen here also is a slight erosion in that area as consumers have, have shifted to crossovers because there, there are many, many compact crossovers, you know, from the Nissan Rogue to the Toyota RAV4 to the Honda CRV to the Ford Focus, excuse me, to the Ford Escape that are, that are doing very, very well in the market. And they are um, uh, pulling some of those compact sedan owners over to crossovers. So while compact cars remain very popular and you see a lot of them on the road, they are losing some of their market share to the uh, crossovers. Okay. And let's talk about the convertible market. What's going on with convertibles? Uh, there was at one point that we could look around and every automaker was a player in the game, particularly the number one leader in the segment was uh, you had the Ford with the Mustang and also you had Chrysler that was a player in it. And Chrysler with the redesign of the 200, as you know, it's backed out of the whole segment of it. Is there still a future for convertibles? What's going on with the convertible market? Well, the, the convertible market it will always be around because there is a there is a slice of the U.S. Uh, market that likes them a lot and is willing to buy them. The the a uh, couple of things have happened. One is remember this industry went through a huge um, recession from two, late 2008 uh, for the next few years after that, and when the financial when the manufacturers got pinched financially including two of them going through bankruptcy, you know, you're, you're going to pull back and you're going to focus on the basics and you're not going to basically have any money for any sort of fringe or optional uh, programs. And the convertible is obviously a somewhat of a fringe. I mean, it's not a core, it's, it's an add-on, if you will. I mean, it is usually designed afterwards. But at any rate, that's a major reason why we've seen a reduction in the number that are offered. Another reason is that some of these models, and I'm thinking of the new Chrysler 200, 
the design when you have a when you have a fastback design such as the Chrysler 200 it really does not lend itself to engineering a convertible. So I think that has contributed to the fact that there's no convertible there where there used to be in the past. But I do want to emphasize that the convertible market has not gone away. I mean, it was somewhere between 1% and 2% of the market. Now it's, it's a little bit under 1%. And there are some models, such as the Chevrolet Camaro, the Ford Mustang, and a lot of the European models that continue, like the BMW 3 Series, et cetera, that continue to offer convertible or cabriolet models, and they will because um, they, they, um, it's designed in from the beginning. They have owners out there who like them and will buy them again. So I would say that while it's a small market and it's declined, it's not going to go away. And actually, Jeff, uh, we may see as the financial positions of these manufacturers continue to improve, and I'm sure you've seen that a lot of them are very profitable now, they may decide you know, to go back into it at some point uh, with an existing model. So we may see it improve in the future. And one other thing before we bring this to a close, what about the luxury car market? Uh, when we look at uh, the BMW S Class, we look at the Cadillac, uh, Cadillacs uh, trying to uh, return to being back the luxury leader they once were. Uh, we look at Lincoln that's going to be re entering the marketplace pretty soon with the Continentals. Um, probably a, we're looking at maybe a year or maybe a little further down the line. Uh, we're looking at Audi being a player in the whole luxury car segment. Let, let's talk about that. Um, wh where do you see the whole market going toward the on the upper end with luxury luxury cars? Well, it's an interesting part of the market. It's generally about between 11 and 12 percent of the overall market, but it is super competitive. You have 15 makes right now, European, domestic, and Asian, all of whom are clamoring to get any tenth of a point of market share in that luxury market. And um, that's one of the reasons, by the way, to get back to what we mentioned before, that's one of the reasons they're pushing – leasing so hard is that by le by by offering a lease for a BMW 3 series or a Mercedes C class or a uh, Lincoln MKZ at 399 a month those manufacturers can entice can attract a non luxury owner to move up but so we're seeing we're seeing each one of these 15 brands just doing everything they can in terms of leasing but also in terms of new products to, to, to get an upper hand and to gain market share. The three brands, uh, Mercedes-Benz, BMW, and Lexus, are the, are the clear leaders in terms of volume, and they compete with each other ferociously. They are, re they are redesigning their models very, very frequently. They are heavily into the lease market. Um, they are using uh, incentives whenever necessary. So um, it's, a, it's a fascinating market, but it's super competitive. And this is one other thing I wanted to briefly mention is that at the end of the year, you will see these brands – uh, trying to get every single additional deal they can, so that would be that's a great time for a customer who's considering a luxury brand to, to shop in a luxury showroom. So, so Tom, you're telling consumers hold off right now on s some of the luxury vehicles until the end of the year. Is that what I'm hearing from you? Well, if they can, if they have a choice, I mean, again, there are good deals in the fall, but but the competition and the need, yes, the need to push every unit off the lot on December 31st is extreme. So if they can wait, I would recommend they wait till December. Yes. I understand. I understand. You're hearing this right from the expert now who's in Detroit, and he's the one also guiding the automakers on opportunities for them. And uh, if you could put a let's, – let's look in the crystal ball for a second. And uh, since you work in the industry and you know everything that's going on with automakers as it relates to sales and future products, what's coming out – what do you see the next trend? Um, at one point, I think the automakers were kind of assuming that the new trend or either they were trying to push the trend to be toward electric vehicles and hybrids. What do you see currently going on as probably the latest trend um, when you look at all the different segments from from crossovers to uh, SUVs to trucks? Um, kind of narrow in for us and let the consumers know uh, where's the trend going for for the remainder of the year and where, where you think it's going for 016. Well, two things I'd mention. One is that we see an ongoing, very strong movement towards the crossover concept. And by that, I mean that, that, that physical design. And right now, that, that crossover, it's an SUV slash crossover design or body type, if you will, comprised about 36%, more than one of every three vehicles right now is a crossover slash SUV. So we see that continuing. Um, and uh, again, to the advantages I mentioned before, another another trend that is inevitable that is getting a lot of visibility now is that more and more of the what we're seeing a movement towards 
autonomous vehicles. And I'm not saying that we're going to get autonomous vehicles tomorrow, but we're seeing on vehicles that are being launched in the marketplace now, we're seeing more and more features that um, that are in the direction of autonomous vehicles. G- give seeing, us an example of some of those features, if you don't mind, uh, Tom. Well, there, there, there are situations now where um, you can actually take your hands off the wheel um, for certain periods of time, even though you're right there. And if, if for something happens, there will be a reminder for you to put the hands back on the wheel. But there are all types of safety features that will automatically remind you when something happens, even if you don't see it. For instance, there's lane departure where if your vehicle on its it goes out it begins to go out of the lane, a warning bell will sound or the seat will vibrate. Something will happen. But there are 360 degree cameras on a lot of vehicles so that they they show you a screen of what's happening all around your vehicle. There are pedestrian uh, warnings for if a pedestrian starting and crossing in front of your vehicle. A, you'll get a warning. B, some of the new vehicles, including the new Volvo XC90, will automatically stop. So that we're seeing these safety technologies that are doing things automatically without necessarily the driver being active. And that is certainly moving in the direction of the vehicle taking care of itself. We will see more of that going forward. Well, let me ask you this as we uh, bring this to a close. Can I drive up to Detroit or drive over to Detroit, depending upon where I'm based at in the United States, and get a better deal? Um, Is that a yes or no? (laughs) Can you drive up to Detroit and get a better deal yes. than you'd get in Atlanta? Yes, sir, or in Atlanta, or Phoenix, or California. No, no, no. The, the 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 metro markets, uh, they are they have a high. Every metro market in the United States has a high concentration of dealers, which makes it a very very price competitive market. So if you're in Atlanta or you're in Chicago or New York or L.A., you're in a similar situation where there's intense. Uh, pressure to move units, so they're going to want to see every consumer walk in the door, and it doesn't make any difference which city you're in. Well, Tom, why do I see from time to time when I'm scrolling through the Detroit newspaper or, or looking online, I see these phenomenal lease deals or purchase purchase deals? Is it for employees only, or is it just yes. for regular folks like me? Well, no. It's if you read the fine print, Jeff. Uh, I read those too, and I'm amazed sometimes at the deals I see. Um, as a matter of fact, sometimes we've commented here that that uh, cars are less expensive than smartphones. But the reason for that is that a lot of those are for company employees only. And remember, there's a lot of big suppliers here who also have a lot Good of point. employees. And also, their leases, and they're 24-month leases, and they have mileage restrictions of 10,000 miles. And so there's, and they also are, a lot of them are loyalty-related. So you can only get it if you're turning in the same brand vehicle. So there's a lot of restrictions on those deals. Gotcha, gotcha. Makes good sense. So you heard it right from the expert uh, listeners uh, from Tom Libby, who works with all of the most of the automakers, and he has a great insight on what's going on to the industry. So you heard a few things from us as far as looking at the different segments, uh, which segments you could probably get the better deals on. Uh, Tom also focused on when it's probably the best time to make that move on a luxury vehicle, if you can hold off just a little bit. Um, I'll have him back later and we'll probably delve more into the used car market, uh, seeing that a lot of consumers are buying used cars and a lot of automakers also have what they call certification programs or pre-certified programs. So with that said, uh, Tom, thank you very much for taking time to speak with us. Thanks for sharing your insights with us. I almost feel like it uh, was nine years ago when I reached out to you uh, for writing my first uh, car buying guide. You just offered a lot of insights to us and um for more information on on finding out uh, how to get your best deal, you can also zoom over to jeffcars.com and uh, check out the new car buying guide. Also check out the new car reviews and check out other tips that uh, we offer to help you navigate the car buying process. Thanks again, Tom. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much for having me. Okay. Have a good day. You too.